Ready? We're good. So my name is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, this topic is will it blend the joint OpenStack Kubernetes environment? Um, and I really want to set out and have a practical discussion about how to combine these two technologies. And we're going to go into a lot of detail. But just cut to the end, since it's beer time. Uh, not today, contrary to what I think a lot of other sessions are going to tell you. But in the future, yes. And we'll talk about whys and hows. Um, a little bit about my background. For those of you who don't know me, I've been in the open, open stack community for quite a long time. I served on the board for four years. Uh, I was co-chair of Def, I was really ran the Def Core, co-chaired it with different co-chairs, the Def Core, what is core initiative. Um, I was, wrote the first installer, which SUSE's Thank You still uses today for OpenStack. Um, I'm founder of a hybrid infrastructure automation project called Digital Rebar that deploys Kubernetes. So we're actively deploying Kubernetes. We've done it a couple different ways now. We've done Swarm and Mesos and Cloud Foundry. So we, we really know this space. And Digital Rebar itself is a microservices containerized uh, application. So we've, we walk the walk. Um, so if you're, you're wondering about my credentials, I know OpenStack, no Kubernetes and containers. Um, and that's, so that's what my company does. I was at Dell for a while before that. And I've been doing data center ops for a long, long, long time. So when I look at this problem and somebody tells me I'm going to run OpenStack on Kubernetes, the first thing I'm going to do is say, well, that's an operations question. We care about operators, but operators are different than developers. They have different needs. Their success as an operator is critical to the project success. And I think if one of the things that I've seen over the years, OpenStack uh, has not paid enough attention to the operational concerns. You hear this a lot. Um, and I think you'll see the same thing in any new project. I could say the same thing about Kubernetes, where I co-chair the cluster ops sig. So we're trying in Kubernetes to bring operators of Kubernetes together to have a voice early in the project. Same, same thing. It's really important. And one of the key tenets to me about operators is operators don't want to learn how to use the platform they're installing to install the platform they're using. I'm letting people parse that one out. So the idea here is that if I'm doing, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a uh, big detractor from the concept of triple O, um, or there's a Kubernetes on Kubernetes thing going on. Um, that's a whole other talk. Um, and I, I think that operators want operationally simple, direct things. And you have, it's important because everything I'm going to say after this, if you're like, no, operators want complex, really con you know, convoluted ways to install things, and they love abstractions on abstractions, Go, just go, because that's not, we don't agree with what an operator wants. Um, and before we go any further, I'll also say I think Kubernetes has good, sound operational characteristics. We'll talk about that too. And so the focus here is not Kubernetes per se as an as a application platform. It's, at, it's Kubernetes as an underlay, okay? And when we talk about Kubernetes as an underlay, it's not Docker, it's Kubernetes, and that means that we want to use the features of Kubernetes. If we disable Kubernetes in order to make this work, we're not really winning. So my assumption in this talk is that the, the idea here is we're using Kubernetes as the way Kubernetes is designed to be used. Now, if you don't know what that, exactly what that means, we'll get there a little bit. But um, it's important uh, to understand that. And I call this the Kubernetes sandwich. Right. And we'll get back to one of the challenges of the Kubernetes sandwich. But this is what a lot of people have been talking about. Physical infrastructure, put Kubernetes down, I install OpenStack on Kubernetes as a Kubernetes application, and then because I love Kubernetes, I'm going to run Kubernetes on top of that OpenStack implementation because that's what we do. So without going into a lot of detail, uh, I'm going to gloss over everything about Kubernetes. It's basically a container scheduler. Um, I do not consider it orchestration. There's a difference, but if you're used to OpenStack, OpenStack is a VM scheduler. It places VMs on things. K Kubernetes places containers on things. It's a little bit different approach because it's really designed to do services and maintain services. So it's, it's really a service service, if you want to think about it. And it's predominantly designed to run applications that are designed to run on it. This isn't earth-shattering news. 
but it's important, right? So Kubernetes is really going to work well if you have an application that you said, I think I want to use Kubernetes or Swarm or Mesos. Those are, if I want to run containerized microservice applications, it's going to work really well. If you started with a uh, persistent state database, mm, maybe not today. And so it's really designed for things that use immutable infrastructure, uh, which I might call stateless ops, something like that. If you don't understand that word, I'm not defining it. 12-factor <laughs> configuration, um, which if you don't, haven't heard of, how many people have heard of 12-factor configuration? Oh, God, you guys are an open stack crowd. Um, this is easy. So go read up on 12-factor configuration if you're doing container ops work, especially with a platform. They expect you to inject configuration in using this pattern. It's a 12-factor.org type of thing. It's really important for how to making these things work. They assume you're using 12-factor uh, configuration and that you're service-oriented so that you've, you've decomposed things into RESTful services. These are our assumptions for Kubernetes users. And this is a little picture uh, that we built in the cluster ops sig in Kubernetes to explain what Kubernetes is. This is the middle slide of a sequence of like eight slides. And so I'm not gonna explain this either, but it's in here because enough of you don't know what Kubernetes is that I need to show you this is a Kubernetes architecture. Kubernetes boils down to two services. There's an API service, which is in the middle, that runs on the control plane, and a uh, uh, what they call kubelet, which is the thing that actually starts and stops containers. Think of it as KVM controller on the, on the, on the host. So it's fundamentally a pretty simple service. There's a whole bunch of stuff around it, but that's it. Okay. You guys now know all you need to know to run Kubernetes. Um, and the reason why everybody's excited here is because of this assumption that Kubernetes will bring rainbows and unicorns to your data center for you. I'm serious, right? It has built in, uh, and well, let, me, let me work up to this, but it has uh, built in capabilities that can make an application designed to run in Kubernetes, trademark, um, HA, upgradable, robust, and durable without doing a lot of the work you normally have to do to make applications upgradable, robust, and durable. So why do this? So yay, Kubernetes is gonna bring me a rainbow. I've always wanted a rainbow. I'm an operator at heart, so I don't believe in... You know. So the idea here is that we have a couple of assumptions that are driving this, this desire to have OpenStack run with a Kubernetes underlay. First, opera OpenStack operations is still really hard. People generally agree that that's true. I would refine this, and I would say data center operations is still really hard. OpenStack is just a victim of that. Uh, Kubernetes will find, you'll find the same thing. Um, we already are doing most of our deploys in containers, right? There's Cola, there's OpenStack Ansible, there's Juju, right? Yeah, everybody's already using containers anyway. Kubernetes is awesome at containers. Uh, and now you can see we're getting gradually towards the less accurate statements. Kubernetes means that I get free upgrades and availability, my rainbows and unicorns, and that Kubernetes is simple, secure, and stable for operators, right? That ignore the three-month release cycle and the fact that you're using Docker under the covers, perfectly ready to go. Um, that said, actually, I, I'm not de denigrating Kubernetes. I think it's got a lot of promise. But if you're gonna deploy an application, if you're an operator and you're gonna deploy Kubernetes on your infrastructure, you're gonna wanna know how to secure it, how to make it stable, how to make it HA and upgradable. Those are the questions you should be asking. And they're ops questions, they're not Kubernetes questions. All right, so, did I lose a slide? So let's start talking about the actual details on where we are. Cool. I'm going to take a breath. Everybody with me so far? Yeah? Good. Um, cool. And I'll, before I jump into, these are, these are my, uh, my oh shit slides. Um, and so we'll, we'll, set, we'll sort of set the bar and then build things up. Um, right? I don't, I'm not trying to, I, I'll happily sell you all Kubernetes integrated OpenStack. I can do that. But... You know, I'm not, I don't really have a logo behind this slide deck where I'm trying to prove it one way or another. I'm, I'm in favor of the operators having success. If they do that with OpenStack or Kubernetes or Mesos, it's, it's okay. Do it the way it's gonna make your company successful with a, a fit. All right, good, now I can rant. So my first and biggest concern with this is the marketing around Kubernetes under OpenStack is a hot mess, right? When we announced at the Austin Summit, 
Kubernetes under OpenStack, the message that got out was Kubernetes is stable, OpenStack is not, right? And it confuses OpenStack's one platform message, which the OpenStack official message is one platform for uh, metal, VMs, and containers, okay? Whether you agree with the message or not, that's the message. And it's confusing when you start throwing things under that platform as, as a thing. So I, I don't care about whether it's true or not or any of that. It's just confusing. Because now people are like, I thought OpenStack did that. Wait a second, does it? So marketing confusion is actually a serious problem in open source communities where we're actually dealing with technical issues that we're trying to resolve because we have a tendency to say, well, that already works, we're already doing that, or we present things as fait accompli, when they, which is French, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know how to say that in Spanish. Um, how, do, can, how do we say it in Spanish, fait accompli? Um, so the idea here is that we've got people promoting this um, because they want to do, for, for their reasons, um, that might be good or bad, but it, I don't think it's on message and I think it's really confusing, so I have a problem with that. And then we add in uh, confusion into um, what I'm trademarking as plain old container installs, pokies, um, where you can, you know, Canonical, Rackspace, and Cisco have projects spun up around doing container installs, which are not Kubernetes installs. As a matter of fact, the Cola stuff that I'm watching people reuse the Docker containers for ignores where most of the effort seems to go for Cola, which is in Ansible scripts. Right, so it's, it's very convoluted and confusing, and it's easy for somebody to say, well, OpenStack's doing all this container install stuff. That just translates into Kubernetes. Let's talk about what happens. And this is the other thing. So that's one, marketing. Yeah. Um, the other reason I'm scared about this is I feel like we're kicking the ball down the field. We're saying, hey, there's this bright and shiny thing called Kubernetes. It's going to solve these problems that we haven't been able to solve so far. Just wait for us to get all that stuff going, and I promise you, in a release or two, it will be better. And, and that's just not an acceptable answer. One, because it's never just a release or two. And second, it means that we're not actually dealing with operational issues. And I can promise you, the operational issues are not magically solving themselves because of Kubernetes, and we'll talk about that some more. Um, and then we're not necessarily solving the problem by adding another layer into our existing install infrastructures, right? So if I come in and say, hey, I'm gonna use Kubernetes to install OpenStack, and by the way, I still need an orchestration thing to manage the upgrades, and I still need an orchestration thing to handle when those things change and how to set them up, and then I also, by the way, need a Kubernetes installer. Maybe I'll use Kubernetes to install Kubernetes and OpenStack, and, and that is not a win, okay? And so, I believe that the right way to fix operational issues is to fix the underlying, this was hard because it didn't uh, throw the right log messages. This was hard because the configuration wasn't documented. This was hard because when I talk across two API versions, it crashes and I can't upgrade if I don't have N plus one API compatibility. That's what we need help fixing. Those are really serious operations issues. They're not platform issues, they're just ops issues. Um, and then the other thing about all this stuff, and this is true of all the pokies, not all the pokies, uh, canonical distinctly not, but the, if you're relying on Docker to run your OpenStack infrastructure, I, Docker is not that stable, right? You're relying on something, it, it's, a, it's a system management thing that runs and sometimes crashes. That's, I guess we're operators, we're supposed to not have, we're not supposed to inject unreliable things into the infrastructure on purpose unless it's chaos monkeys. So I guess maybe we should consider Docker a chaos monkey for us and then just all go home and have beer. Um, oh, and then networking, networking and storage are not, we just had to talk about network storage that had to resolve down to GitHub patches on other sections to figure out storage. Whoops, and I just hit blank screen, hold on. All right, so that's why I'm scared. Make sense? But, yeah, blenders, the blender lid is off. We are, we are scattering Kubernetes and Docker all over OpenStack, and that is it. So I don't wanna, I, I got my rants out of the way. Let's talk about actual, it's gonna happen, right? Uh, let's figure out what we're gonna do about this, how we're gonna make it go. Um, 
And so to get to that point, I need to do a little bit of backtracking, but not much. So pokey, containers. I have things in containers. That's great. I have Kubernetes. And in this case, this slide, you could actually substitute Kubernetes for other container scheduling systems, right? Rancher and uh, Docker Swarm, something else. Uh, we use Compose. We really like that. It's simple. Um, so containers are often treated as lightweight VMs or package daemon sets, right? So I just, it, you know, Python, I don't want to have to deal with all my pip install stuff. I put it in a container. I just boot it, and it runs, and I, hadn't, I don't have to download anything again. It's a big win. Um, and a lot of our, con our pokey container installs that, you know, use containers in that way. The canonical guys use it as a, as a partitioning thing, so they, they install stuff in a container like a lightweight VM. It's really cool. That's, those are, those are, are operational wins, but they are not Kubernetes, okay? So if you're dealing with Kubernetes, they expect you to be doing immutable containers with a 12-factor configuration. They don't expect you to be doing a Docker exec to inject OpenStack configuration into that container after they've scheduled it. As a matter of fact, you really can't, because if you're playing with Kubernetes, you don't know where that container's running. You certainly don't want to do Docker execs against it for a running container. That's not how you inject configuration into Kubernetes. Okay. And so what we really have to be able to do is look at a, a container platform that manages the full container lifecycle. So it's going to put containers someplace. You don't know where. It's going to assign an IP address. You don't know where. It's going to turn the things on or off. It's going to move things around and schedule them based on its algorithm, which we want because its algorithm is pretty smart and it's how you build scalable, robust Kubernetes-made applications. So in order for us to use Kubernetes well, we have to deal with full container lifecycle. We have to be, have containers that are able, need to be added and removed, and they have to be able to handle IP address changes as the system comes and goes. Right? So that means I brought up a container on another machine, it came up with a new IP address, and now all of a sudden, if you were depending on the IP address, you now have a uh, identity mismatch. You have to figure out where things are. No problem, just use a load balancer and a name, and you're all good, but you have to be able to do that and have the systems rely on names, not on IP addresses. Or on a service registry like console, which is what we use, or etcd or something like that, where you look up where a, a system is in order to talk to it. So you don't just assume that it's, this IP address is stable, right? And so the ways that you work around things like that are you do things like pin containers. So the pokey uh, installs, you didn't think I was going to be using that term that much, did you? The pokey installs um, are, a lot of cases, pinning containers to hosts, right? It's just segmentation. It's just packaging. So they don't expect things to move around, and so they just let the, they disable a lot of the, the Kubernetes functionality. And I, I'm not going to consider it a win if you've had to say, in order for this node to be a Nova uh, compute node, I'm going to pin a whole bunch of containers to node 6, right? That is not the way Kubernetes is designed to work. That's actually an anti-pattern for Kubernetes. You want to unpin things. I keep doing that. All right. Um, SDN has to be resolved. So if you're doing Kubernetes, Kubernetes has containers. Containers have, uh, they, they base, not in Kubernetes. Kubernetes expects all the, everything to talk to everything. Uh, so it's a very open network until you add an SDN and then things change. And so if you're dealing with Kubernetes, it has software-defined networking expectations. OpenStack has software-defined networking expectations. And we have to resolve what happens when those go on. We're not turning off Neutron. You can't anymore. We don't necessarily want to turn off SDN capabilities within Kubernetes, and so we're sort of stuck in this, wait a second, let's figure out where the networking layers align or don't align, or figure out a way not to have them clash. And if you're an operator and you're troubleshooting networking, multiple SDN layers, it just it makes me nervous. Okay. Um, so how do we handle, and then, uh, Container persistence is still being resolved. So if I want to put a block store behind a container and make sure that container comes and gets the same storage every time, that's not a resolved problem yet. We're getting closer, but it's still emerging as far as I can tell. I haven't seen anybody. Has anybody seen a good container persistence story? No. Okay. I'd love to see one. That would be great. Um, and then we also have the assumption of exclusive ownership and administrative control. So you have to be able to say, you know what? 
I, I really don't control where the service is and where it's going. That's the first thing you give up when you start using a containerized, Kubernetes containerized type of, of infrastructure. You're giving up control of starting and stopping that container. So what do we have to do about it? Um, first, we have to figure out how to resolve the overall complexity of adding more components. Um, so we have to be able to say, in this, in this infrastructure at the end of the day, it is less complex than it was at the beginning of the infrastructure. I'm okay if we have a blip. I'll show you a path where we have more complexity, but it, it might trend towards less complexity. Um, we need to be able to make sure Kubernetes is, is stable and controlled. So this is not a win if you don't know how to upgrade Kubernetes. It's not a win if you don't know how to upgrade Docker. It's not a win if you don't know how to secure Kubernetes. Uh, as, your, as your underlying control plane. Um, luckily, all these are things that have to get resolved in, by the Kubernetes community themselves, but they're not resolved yet, so that's a challenge. Um, networking, I talked about already, so I won't keep diving into it. Um, IP mobility, I've talked about quite a bit, mixed networking models. Um, and then we have to deal with utility things that operators care about, uh, like upgrades, maintenance, um, and then mixing Kubernetes workloads. So this is, this is a really interesting one. Um, in my travels, I talk to ISVs, people writing software to sell as a product. Uh, I'm seeing a significant uptake of those ISVs using Kubernetes as a platform that they embed quietly in their product. Right, what we're talking about here is the same thing. I'm gonna sell you OpenStack. Never mind, it has Kubernetes under it, it's just OpenStack. And that's what, that's what you imagine the, the model gonna, should be, maybe, eventually. And if every ISV in OpenStack is using Kubernetes under the covers, at some point, operators are going to look at it and say, you know what, you guys, we have six things all using Kubernetes as standalone silos. Shouldn't I just have a, a, a shared Kubernetes infrastructure to run my software on? Which makes perfect sense. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we're going to have to resolve of how you start mixing Kubernetes workloads into this. Because it doesn't make sense to spin up six Kubernetes clusters especially 6HA Kubernetes clusters if they're just sharing their, if they're just basically running apps next to each other. Okay. Whew. All right, we're gonna go up, so that's down, up, ready for some ups. Um, so there are real potential benefits for doing this. It's not just a ridiculous idea that we should avoid. Um, there are significant values in, in considering this. Um, and, I think I went through some of the dangers already, so I'll, sk I'll skip what happens when the meat disappears from the sandwich. Um, so part of the, so Kubernetes ecosystem, uh, and this is, a, this is a big statement, but, but I think I can back it up. I think Kubernetes ecosystem is bigger than OpenStax, right? That means, because Kubernetes, it runs on Google, on Google, it runs on Amazon, it runs on VMware, it runs on Metal, it runs on OpenStack. So there, there's really no infrastructure target that people can't use Kubernetes on. It's one of the things that's attractive about it. It's an isolation layer. And that means that you don't have to be in private cloud to use Kubernetes, right? Now, it could be OpenStack private clouds are spinning up Kubernetes too, but that to me is not this underlay problem. It's a, that's a public cloud problem. So um, to be part of that Kubernetes ecosystem brings us a lot of benefits. It brings us standard operating procedures. It brings us um, all sorts of collaboration and, and you know, basically a, a big place to pitch and talk about message, right? We would be the VM provider in the Kubernetes ecosystem, which is powerful. Um, we get to leverage Docker packaging efforts. Um, so Docker packaging is a win. Being able to ship containers that already have all the pieces and they're tested and immutable and somebody's QA'd it, that's a really nice thing, right? I know from, from what we do where we say, hey, just download the Docker components and I don't worry about which OS you're running and all this stuff, it's, it's big, it's a huge deal. Um, upgrades definitely benefit from the Kubernetes process. So Kubernetes tags the VMs and you are able to um, basically say replace this, this container set with that container set based on a tag and you can do A-B tests and all sorts of great stuff. Built-in functionality, it's powerful. Uh, Kubernetes has a job scheduler. So the times when you're like, I just need to run this one thing one time and, and make it go, whether it's garbage collection or I need to back up my database or something like that, Kubernetes has that capability built into it, right? Not huge win, that's a free behavior that you get just for using Kubernetes as your underlay. Um, fault tolerance, 
um, is a key, so we get free fault tolerance. If something goes down, we're going to automatically move containers and spin them up. Uh, Kubernetes, I didn't talk much about load balancing here, but it uses the load balancer, requires a load balancer, just like HA OpenStack does, requires a load balancer, and it'll automatically, if you move a workload, it's going to automatically direct traffic to the new workload. So you know, fault tolerance is not something you have to build on a service-by-service -service basis. You really get it for free once the Kubernetes cluster has its load balancer connections uh, integrated. Um, if people are already installing Kubernetes, it becomes even easier to install OpenStack. So that could be a, a potential win where you're bringing the infrastructure in with less change. And, um, and uh, it's more, we have more constrained operations. And so this is a, this is a big deal and this is an ongoing fight. Um, and I'll finish since more constrained operations for configuration and operation options. So the idea here is that um, some people subscribe to this, some people don't. OpenStack needs fewer choices. And so if we went all in on the Kubernetes containerized approach, and it doesn't have to be Kubernetes, you could say Swarm or uh, Mesos or Rancher or whatever running OpenStack. To make that work for any of those platforms, we're going to have to be more constrained on how OpenStack is configured and operated, like we'd have to agree on 12-factor configuration we'd, or a service registration or how we deal with uh, container movements. Those, those choices are going to narrow things for OpenStack and make it easier to use if we can agree to this as being a predominant install pattern. Right. Now, that said, if you didn't want to use this, the install, the 12-factor, a lot of people really like 12-factor even outside of containers, and so it's generally a, a, a good configuration pattern, but it's much better with containers. Actually, it's really required with containers. All right. Cool. So how could we actually do this? Right. I, I do not believe that we can just stuff OpenStack as is into Kubernetes. Right. Um, right. There, there are persistent services and support pieces that are not ready to work in Kubernetes. And what, what I advocate here is that, and I have a more detailed slide that will come up in a second, so I'll, I'll skip some of this text. What I'm, what I'm saying is let's figure out how to walk or crawl, walk, run into this approach. Let's take the things that are already well suited for containerized, immutable infrastructure services and run those in Kubernetes because as far as I can tell, this is going to happen. And let's not try to force fit something like a Galera cluster into Kubernetes when it's actually not an OpenStack thing at all, it's just our database. And so the idea here is that we want to be smart about which services we pick so that we can make this stuff operational really quickly. Okay. Now you might say, well, do I really need Kubernetes in that case? Uh, the premise of the talk is I'm going to use Kubernetes anyway. Right? So once, you know, uh, make, you know, marginal value, you get some things for free, Nova, you know, maybe Nova API upgrades or heat upgrades, and you can manage the places where OpenStack's changing. I don't know how often we actually upgrade or patch Galera and, and, and the SQL cluster, right? Hopefully not very often. That should be stable stuff or we pick the wrong database back in. So it looks like this in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, we, think, we talk about things like a load balancer that's ac external to either Kubernetes or OpenStack. Oh, and I tweeted, I should, I tweeted these slides, so they're on SlideShare. Uh, database, message bus, right? No, we, we have notoriously, I was at the, at the Ops Summit in New York, and they were like, ah, everybody hates RabbitMQ. And then they're like, well, maybe it's just that's where things fail. Maybe it's not Rabbit's fault. That just catches all the errors. But either way, it, you're, you're probably going to want to put your Rabbit infrastructure, which cares about some persistent, some IP stability um, outside of this infrastructure, and treat that as a, sort of a sacred cow and, and not try to run it as, as hard. Uh, load balancer, we already talked about outside of it. Of course, you have to have a Kubernetes infrastructure now. Um, even the people who want to run Kubernetes on Kubernetes, you do have to start with a server that runs Kubernetes. So you need Kubernetes controllers, you need Kubernetes workers. Um, I'm not sure I would advocate, but you could, I guess, put the workers, Kubernetes workers on the Kubernetes controllers and then put, make that the open stack. So you could get down to a three node control plane, um, which we already have. But you, at a minimum, 
In, real, in realistic terms, you're going to build a three-node control plane for Kubernetes and put three nodes of workers so that you're going to have a three-node OpenStack control plane. So we're talking about six nodes for our control plane, no matter what. Even if you were 100% Kubernetes, OpenStack in Kubernetes, you're still talking about six nodes for your control plane, unless you want to commingle all the control planes, which maybe you do. I don't know. Um, and then, of course, you have OpenStack nodes and software-defined networking. And in this model, I do not advocate, I strongly do not advocate, putting uh, OpenStack compute nodes on, on Kubernetes. Right? So remember, I didn't, the Kubernetes is not the bottom layer in this model. Kubernetes is a bottom layer for the services that are opportunistically easy to move to Kubernetes. Okay. And realistically, what you would do is you would start with 100% of your servers, your services, next to Kubernetes, and then you could say, I'm going to move one service, glance, I don't know, uh, into Kubernetes and see how it does. And if it's working pretty well, I could move the next one and the next one. And if I have trouble with one, I can fall back to the, uh, to the other ones, right? And that, that would be a way that you would migrate this, this thing over. Instead of just saying, hey, we're going to put every, just stuff round peg, square hole, I got it. Um, because I think that that way to resolve operational issues is basically just going to have us play, playing whack-a-mole as we fix one thing, something else is going to break. Okay. This makes sense as a picture? So I actually think this is a very pragmatic approach. It says at the bottom of this, I actually have all the, you know, my company does enough of the infrastructure pieces, Kubernetes installs and stuff like that, that you could actually build this in a reasonable amount of time as an infrastructure and manage it and then start doing that walk across of OpenStack pieces. It, it is a operationally developed me sound way to take this approach into building this infrastructure. Um, and it's not years of effort, it's weeks of effort. And then what's fun about this is then you can actually go into a development process and you can service by service tweak those services with patches and work in the community to say, I need you to fix object persistence in uh, and I haven't played with any of these, so I'm, I'm talking, I'm making up which service, right? Heat, you know, I need heat to be fixed so that it doesn't break when I shut down that container unexpectedly. Those are the types of operational changes that, frankly, are beneficial to the project as a whole, whether you're doing this work or not. And frankly, that's, to me, what we want to be talking about. Any changes that you want to make into this infrastructure should ideally help OpenStack. Right. Oh, I, you know, I really need you to be resilient when we change versions of the APIs between, you know, Nova API and Nova, Nova Agent, right? Which I think is, that's a pretty much solved problem at this point. But those are the types of solved problems that we're going to flush out really quickly. And we want to flush them out in an iterative way so that we can fix them in an iterative way rather than having to create a fork of OpenStack where we're hacking in a whole bunch of stuff because we're trying to make it, make it work. Um, Summary. Cool. We have lots of times for questions. So, OpenStack stability operability is not solved by changing out the underlay platform itself. Okay. The things about keeping a database server running, keeping DNS running, um, building a public key infrastructure so you're securing communications, those are just operational issues that have to be resolved. And OpenStack challenges where you have to where you have to survive a reboot of a service, that those are those, all those issues have to be resolved, right? It's not Kubernetes is not magically going to make uh, a, an OpenStack service survive a reboot, right? Without creating cruft in the database, you have to do that if you're going to use these containerized methods. Um, I think technical leadership and the mode have to be motivated if they want this thing to happen. Right? It can't just happen from one, one group outside of the community or you know, a small portion of the community saying, we want to do this, and then showing up with a whole bunch of patches. The patches have to make sense operationally for other people. Uh, I think we have to resolve the serious mar messaging confusion. I think we did better. I was watching the Twitter stream from the, the keynote. Sam Charrington, he's not, I know he's not in the room because he's on the plane, um, was pointing this out. Right? We, in the last summit, we really created a lot of marketing confusion with the stack and eddies and, and all that. The keynotes did not repeat that this time, but they didn't resolve it either. So we're, if we want this to happen, 
we need to resolve it because otherwise we're going to keep sort of sending these weird mixed messages into market. And if the message that we send into market is Kubernetes is, is stable and has all these great features instead of OpenStack, you know, and OpenStack needs it, the message that's going to be received in market is Kubernetes is stable, great, has all these features that you really care about, and OpenStack isn't. I just, that's, it unfortunately, it's that simple in my opinion. Um, but I do think we have to do it, right? You know, part of me when I started, when I submitted this talk and when I was doing it, there was a thought that there'd be an option to walk away from the Kubernetes integration. Um, and I don't think that's a, actually a viable alternative at this point. When I, when I think about this topic deeply, when I look at what's going on in, in the containerization communities and container scheduling, I believe that OpenStack is going to have to accept this as a going forward proposition. I'm not in a technical leadership. I, I don't have the, the arm, the, the, you know, the will to bend um, TC and people like that, but I am playing in Kubernetes right now. Uh, I'm watching the, the community forum and I'm watching uh, people in enterprise and software development basically adopt this platform as a, as a base platform to abstract the infrastructure issues, right? Remember, I'm the interoperability guy from the board for a couple of years. Interoperability is really hard. It's hard between Amazon and Google. It's hard between OpenStack and Metal. It's hard between, it's hard. People want to see something that helps abstract that information from their developers so they don't have to do ops as much and they don't have to worry about HA and upgrades and they get all this stuff for free. This platform is going to impact developers who are bringing applications into the OpenStack community and they're going to be putting Kubernetes in or something similar. And it doesn't matter which, which one it is, I think Kubernetes has a good shot of winning. I, I should never have said that. Kubernetes has a good chance of being a dominant platform that we have to cope with and not dying. I don't think any one of these platforms necessarily is going to win and walk away with the crown and, and Mesos or, Ranch, or Docker Swarm or Rancher are going to go home and cry in their beer. Um, I actually think there's a lot of space in this market for different people because at the end of the day, the, and this is the whole point, the changes that we would make to OpenStack to adapt to Kubernetes are good ones for the community to make from an operability perspective anyway. So accept it, take that as a target, use that as an application architecture, and then move on. That's it. And I'll, I'll flip back to the, oh, to this screen because you guys probably want to keep seeing that one. I have questions, yeah, and I'll repeat them. Do we, there's a mic coming up. But if you're close, go ahead. And uh, so, uh, again, you said that a lot of stuff will fail if you put it into container. Right. Uh, like some OpenStack microservices, some, as you said, hit something or any, anything. Yep. But uh, doesn't um, a lot of things that are needed to have HA for these services are basically the same that you need to have to work for them to to survive container reboot, I mean container reschedule or whatever. So do you think there is actually a b big problem here? Because um, we are, uh, sorry, we yeah. are doing containers, uh, open second containers, by we I mean, uh, as you said, four or maybe more companies out there. Yep. And uh, well, it works. <laughs> So, oh, so this is the difference between OpenStack and, so the question is, you know, are the operational concerns I'm pointing out as severe as I'm saying? Um, and so, and I, we, have, we have some experience. So our, our company, we took our project, which is a monolithic project, and switched it into a micro containers project. So we went through this journey of converting, you know, a stateful, what, what had been a stateful app into a stateless app. Um, and so you, you were right that OpenStack is designed to do HA failovers. However, there's a big difference between a server going down failure and what a container scheduling infrastructure is going to do. So the, the, the pokey 
container installs, make the assumption that they are placing containers on machines and those containers are persistent. They do not use a container scheduling algorithm that might move, rebalance, shuffle a container. And so what, what happens in those cases is that if you, have, if you are doing this on a regular basis, which is the assumption you have to bake in, then that the state, and you're also assuming, right, you, you're gonna have places where there's gonna be transactions or data or things that are held in state that you don't want held in state. It's just a cleanup. I, I'm not saying it's not doable, I just think you're gonna find that there's, that there's issues in how it works. Yeah, but uh, I'm just sure that guys who work on this, who do almost like on Kubernetes, they actually rely on Kubernetes providing services for them instead of assuming anything. Right. Like, as you said, uh, the basic thing, use uh, DNS names and instead of uh, IPs. It's all over the place already. So it's not an issue already. It, it's not an issue except that when, when you go through this, it flushes out things where it is a real issue and you find them and you that just have to fix them. And so my, my point is not that it can't be done. Actually, my point is that it should be done and that this process is gonna drive you to do it more. And what I'm saying is those are, those are gonna to have to be bugs that the, per, the community agrees to address more quickly, but there will be cases where you're like, oh, I should never have stored this in a file on my system, or I shouldn't have required a lock here, or I should have not blocked this memory or had this process take so long because it's, it runs into problems when containers move or die. That optimization and tuning it has to be done, it's just gonna take time and it's gonna get more exposed in these containers. It's a huge benefit to OpenStack for exactly the reason you're saying. The more we hit this, the more robust and durable the system will be. It's a standard ops problem. Does that make sense? I, but I don't, I, don't think the, I don't think OpenStack is all the way there. It's really close, I think. Close is not there. I, just we we didn't of course we didn't test uh, a lot of it on huge scale and everything, but it really already can work totally on Kubernetes. I, just I, so I so one I'm completely certain that you can spin up an OpenStack cluster in Kubernetes. I, I think that that is different than operating an OpenStack cluster for a long period of time and scaling a, upgrades and doing the things that you expect to do with Kubernetes. I, you, can, you can run anything, start it, shut, you know, get it going, sort of test it, and then shut it down and not expose any of this. It, the, we're talking about operators, not science projects. And what I'm trying to propose is that we have to have an operational approach to making this go where you are not dependent on the fact that somebody had a, a bad, you know, in, in a release that's out has now had a bad segmentation design that doesn't survive this process and you're dependent on a migration to, uh, you know, the Q release before, before it's fixed. So what I'm advising here is a, a oper you know, step-by-step -step operational guideline, not jumping all in without a parachute. There's a question in the back. And I'll, I'll tell you, what, when we did this ourselves, what would happen is we would just stress test things and we would bang on it and every one, you know, it's still to this day, every once in a while something falls out of the tree and you're like, you should have, shouldn't have not put a database lock there because it caused this transaction to hold and we don't expose it until you're doing a big deployment. And you're like, oh, okay, we gotta break that transaction up because it's, it's risky. That's the type of thing that you just have to work through. It's just time. Um, so you said that marketing is basically sending out the wrong signals right now. Yes. Um, do you think that is any different from what marketing did like three years ago when everybody was running around telling OpenStack is stable, you should totally use that in production? And I mean, that was needed to actually achieve what we have right now and I think marketing is kind of right now driving the whole Kubernetes thing so so the wrong signals is obviously part of marketing right so there's two pieces I'm, I'm going to decompose the marketing sending the wrong signals there's two different issues um, and they're both they're both real issues um, and I, I actually I was guilty in the early days of, of sending out the open what I said was OpenStack is ready for production workloads if you have 
workloads designed for OpenStack, right? The pets versus cattle stuff. This is why we drove pets versus cattle so long. And the problem was people heard only the first sentence and not the but part of that sentence. So um, one of the reasons why I think that we should slow down on the message of this underlay piece is because we're, we're over marketing it for, you know, sort of to try and grab onto Kubernetes coattails, which is over marketed. Um, and so Unfortunately, that's it's one of the things I, I'm, I've become less enamored about with open source is that you can take marketing budgets and sort of go wild with them without any checks and balances that you would have in a commercial product. Um, that's, that, that's it. Um, so that, I, I think that that is one of, the, one of the marketing problems that we have. Um, and now I'm struggling to remember my second point about marketing. Um, yeah, oh, and I, I just, I think, so that's, that's one. And then the other, the other one is I think that the Kubernetes sandwich, um, people see that sandwich and ask, why, why do I care about OpenStack? Um, and so that, that is another piece of this. So there's the stability question and is it ready? But there's also the, you know, we are, we are signaling with the Kubernetes sandwich that you don't need OpenStack. Or OpenStack has a much smaller role to play in somebody's data center. Um, and that might be the reality of it, but I don't think it's OpenStack's job to, pr to promote that reality. Um, it's just, and trust me, when I talk to people, that's the question. They're like, containers are going to metal, uh, where's OpenStack fit in? Uh, and that is a hard question to answer with the way we've been addressing this. Not everybody, but some people. Did you, oh. More questions? Oh, come on. I know you all want to get out of here, and we're actually a little bit over time, aren't we? All right, I'm happy to take one-on-one -on -one questions. I'm happy to have Twitter wars about this. I'm happy to have you say you're, comp you're saying things that make my company really sad. I'm trying to be honest and pragmatic. That's what I've always done. So thank you for taking time to come to the last session. I hope you enjoyed the summit. See you next time.